Uh, our speaker today is is uh, Dr. Abdullah Dar. Uh, Dr. Dar uh, and I have known each other um, for, um, uh, for 10, 12, 15 years perhaps. Uh, I, I'd like to say we're old friends, Abdullah. We are old, we yeah. Are. Um, Dr. Dar um, comes to us from the McLaughlin Rockman Center for Global Health uh, at the University of Toronto. Um, where he's a professor of public health sciences uh, and of surgery, um, and a senior scientist and director of ethics and commercialization uh, at the McLaughlin Rothman Center. Um, his academic career has really been quite extensive. When I first met Dr. Dar, he was the chair of surgery and doing uh, renal transplants uh, at Oman uh, in one of the Emirates states. Um, and, um, uh, we met at a, at a UN um, conference in Germany, as I recall, yep. around uh, Munich. In Munich, in 1997 uh, or 98, uh, to work on on some international questions. But for Dr. Dar is not only a surgeon, an organ transplant surgeon, but has been involved in global health and bioethics. Uh, his major research focus is on global health inequities, uh, which he will be talking to us about in, in today. Uh, with a particular focus on, on building scientific capacity and increasing innovation in developing countries and in learning how to move things from the lab to the village uh, in terms of, uh, of health. Um, he studied and, and later taught at Oxford, um, was the founding chair of surgery, as I said, at Oman, and remains involved with the UN the World Health Organization and UNESCO as an advisor and consultant. Uh, currently, Dr. Dar is the chair uh, of the board of the UN University International Institute for Global Health. And a topic that we may touch on today, he's also the chair of a quite extraordinary global alliance for chronic diseases, an alliance made up of the leading research institutes uh, of six countries around the world. And so Dr. Dar chairs that. Um, it's with great pleasure that I introduce Abdullah Dar, Innovative Approaches to Reducing Global Health Disparities. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a great pleasure and honor uh, to be here. And thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, uh, and. Uh, uh, the timing is, is uh, pretty interesting considering the elections uh, yesterday uh, and particularly with the, f uh, uh, with the connection to uh, Chicago. Uh, I'm going to be talking for about 35 or 40 minutes um, and right up front I want to say that 70 to 80 percent of the work that I'll be describing here involves my dear friend and colleague Peter Singer who uh, is unfortunately um, not so well this week. He was due to come here next week to give a talk at the Fellows Conference, but won't be there. And uh, we are hoping that uh, we'll be able to reproduce some of my comments. So consider this as a presentation from both myself and my colleague, Peter Singer. Uh, so um, I will describe uh, our work mainly. Um, some of it is not yet in the literature or is uh, not in an accessible form. Uh, and so it will be quite new. And I hope that we'll have a lot of time afterwards to discuss that. So let me first of all start with the definition of global health. It's, it's one of those things that's a little like the elephant and the uh, blind men. Uh, it hasn't settled yet as to exactly what it is. The, my favorite definition is this one, health from the Institute of Medicine report. Health problems, issues, and concerns that transcend national borders uh, may be influenced by circumstances or experiences in other countries and are best addressed by cooperative actions and solutions. And that packs a lot of implications, uh, which I hope uh, will emerge as we, as we discuss issues today. So look at this picture. On the right, uh, you have uh, people living in North America, Western Europe, and the rich countries of the world. Uh, 
expecting to live 80 years after uh, at birth. Uh, on the left, you have Sub-Saharan Africa mainly and other places in the world, but mainly Sub-Saharan Africa, where life expectancy is still 40 years and to some extent in a few countries actually dropping. And so that immediately uh, raises uh, two questions. First of all, how can this be acceptable? We are one species, we live in one planet. Uh, how can this be fair? How can it be sustainable? And the second question is, what can you do about it? So that's uh, partly why Peter and I got involved in uh, global health. Look at the disparities in global health. And I won't enumerate many of these because the list can go on for hours. So every second of every day, a woman, four women will give birth. And every minute, one of those women would die. Uh, for every woman who dies, another 30 suffer lifelong consequences as a result of complications of their pregnancy or the delivery. And that's not to mention the kids who grow up uh, in utero with malnourished mothers or who grow up in very uh, constrained circumstances which then leave lasting legacy of uh, being exposed to metabolic and cardiovascular diseases and mental health problems. So it's a huge problem predicated on poverty uh, as one of the issues. I also want to highlight a, a uh, human rights element to global health. So some of you may be familiar with Amartya Sen's uh, article uh, maybe 10, 12 years ago uh, in the New York Review of Books about 100 million missing women. And those missing women are what you would have expected in a particular country to exist but don't exist because the human rights situation, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the rights, uh, for the rights of women, are such that those women uh, die early uh, or somehow disappear. Now, poor health affects the poor predominantly, including in the United States. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this statistic that uh, in Washington, D.C., as you go down the subway from the richer parts of the city to the poor parts of the city, for every two and a half kilometers along that path, life expectancy drops by one and a half years. So this is a problem between the developed and the developing world, but even in the developed world there are disparities and some of the talks that you will be covering, including here in Chicago, will highlight those issues. Now infectious diseases have received a large part of the attention in the past decade or so. HIV, tuberculosis, malaria, neglected tropical diseases. Um, and that has actually attracted some significant funding from uh, many sources, uh, the biggest source being the Gates Foundation, uh, to address some of the uh, real big challenges uh, facing us with regards to infectious diseases. Part of this is humanitarian impulses, uh, and part of it, as I will show you in a minute, is uh, national security considerations. So viruses do not carry passports. Um, and that has been one of the factors, as I said. But then, neither does climate change or environmental degradation. So people think about infectious diseases, but do not give as much attention to the health implications of climate change and environmental degradation. And those two don't uh, respect borders. Now, our consumption patterns in North America and in the rich countries uh, of the world are such that directly or indirectly we harm people in the developing world. Take our meat consumption, the fact that we have to use good land uh, to uh, produce feed crops, to feed the cattle, uh, with all the environmental implications of that uh, to the rest of the world and all those uh, uh, greenhouse gases released. Uh, but also we export things like tobacco aggressively. The markets here are saturated, people are smoking less, so what do we do? We export that to the developing world, and that's a huge problem, as we will see in a minute. And then a focus uh, of my work over the past uh, uh, four years on chronic non-communicable diseases, uh, that is an area that has been totally neglected. 
and indeed mental health, which I'll come to at the very end, is even more neglected than that. Uh, and that is actually not so just in the developing world, but throughout the world. So this is the national security um, angle. The city, this is a comment from Sandy Berger. You guys might remember him from the Clinton days. He was the national security advisor. And he says that um, a problem that kills huge numbers, crosses borders, threatens to destabilize whole regions, is the very definition of a social security threat. To dismiss disease uh, as a soft issue is to be blind to the hard reality. So that's been some of the calculation. Let me paint another um, layer to this. Uh, what stresses the planet will stress global health. So if uh, we put a stress on food supplies, the poor will suffer. If we uh, don't take care of energy sources, the poor suffer. Uh, and of course climate. Uh, if we uh, um, don't take care of, uh, of the climate, uh, it is primarily the poor who will suffer, not the rich. In some parts of the world, like Canada, we might actually be better off if the climate got a bit warmer. <laughs> it is usually the, the, the poor that will suffer. Water. Uh, totally underestimated as a potential threat to uh, the health of people in the developing world. Um, and, and, and this is something that uh, we need to pay more attention. Uh, and areas like Darfur, where there are people suffering, there are health implications and so on, one of the reasons that that war has perpetuated itself is a water shortage in that part of the world. And underlying it, literally under the ground, are some aquifers that people are thinking about exploiting in the future. Uh, and then another element which is not often thought about in global health is this willful negligence of the consequences of military action. So you go into Iraq, uh, you have your um, uh, policy objectives, but you forget that you have displaced four million people. And those four million people, from the moment they are displaced, uh, become not only victims, but then become uh, a problem in terms of health. But we never think of that as a health issue. And, and it's happening in Afghanistan too. Displaced people, uh, migrations, etc., are a huge uh, health problem. So let me tell you now a little about our center, which uh, Peter Singer and I have built over the past decade. And it has evolved from various different uh, uh, prior uh, institutionary uh, arrangements to what we have now, which is the McLaughlin Rotman Center for Global Health, which is at the University of Toronto and the University Health Network. The niche that we have evolved is this interesting uh, intersection, convergence between global health as defined here, looking at the bigger picture, life sciences, uh, we came to this via uh, genomics initially, uh, and then uh, biotechnology, and now we just call it life sciences, a wider definition. And innovation, a field uh, in its own right. Uh, innovation studies, uh, commercialization, product development, uh, entrepreneurship. So that's the area where uh, our work has ended now. It's that interesting. Um, intersection. Uh, our work is currently organized under four pillars. One is grand challenges, which is what I'm going to be talking about next. Uh, a whole area of ethics. Uh, most of that work now we do with the Gates Foundation and is funded by the Gates Foundation. We have a, a large uh, body of work uh, looking at commercialization and I will talk about that. And then we actually have a laboratory component. So we have a, 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 a big research lab led by Kevin Kane, uh, head of the Sandra Rotman Labs, and he does interesting work um, on tropical diseases, uh, malaria, and so on. So it is a, actually um, a center that encompasses lab to village in, in, a re, in, in, in a real sense. And that part after you leave the lab is really the most complex uh, to do. Uh, we work closely with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We, we have uh, several uh, grants from them, and I'll talk about some of them now. 
and, and we host uh, in the McLaughlin Rotman Center this uh, uh, interesting new initiative called Grand Challenges Canada, which I'll describe. So let's just uh, look at, uh, if you took uh, a new technology or even new policy uh, for um, health and kept it at the center and then asked yourself, uh, how would we actually implement that and get, get it to the people that need it uh, in, in the village, not in a derogatory sense, village, but where it's needed. Um, so you need to look at the science behind it. You need ethical, social, and cultural considerations. You need to find financing, and then there are politics. And then with each of those, you can subdivide the issues, and you can just keep going out outwards with this kind of diagram, finding more and more uh, issues that need to be tackled before you'll get success. Now, this is based on a, on a study that we carried out at the center, which we published uh, about three years ago uh, in Nature, uh, describing these this very complex issues. If you develop a, uh, a fantastic vaccine today, and you think that the job is done, you're completely wrong. That's just the beginning. So let me just now begin to talk about this idea of grand challenges. What is a grand challenge as it has evolved? Uh, you may be familiar with the grand challenges in mathematics about 100 years ago uh, that led to uh, departments of mathematics all over the world focusing on those grand challenges. But as it has evolved, particularly uh, with our work with the Gates Foundation and more recently, a grand challenge is a specific critical barrier. So for example, if you don't have a, a, a vaccine against malaria, the answer is, uh, is the, the question is, what is the critical barrier? Why haven't we done that? We've been researching this for 50 years. So it is about focusing on the barriers, the critical barriers, uh, that if removed would help solve an important health problem in the developing world uh, with a high likelihood of impact globally uh, through widespread, uh, widespread implementation. And implementation is now becoming a science in its own right. Uh, more money is going to go into implementation research in the future, uh, in the next few years, than perhaps in any other area of global health uh, research. So I'm going to describe uh, four initiatives that uh, have the name Grand Challenge uh, in, uh, connected to them. One is the Gates Foundation Grand Challenges in Global Health Initiative. Uh, which was launched seven years ago. Uh, then the Grand Challenges in Chronic Non-Communicable Diseases. Uh, uh, Grand Challenges Canada, which uh, I've just talked about and I'll say more in a few minutes. And then lastly, the work, uh, some of the work that uh, I'm involved in at the moment with NIH and the Wellcome Trust and others in uh, identifying what are the Grand Challenges in Global Mental Health. And I, and I think for me, that's, uh, and I'm sure for many people, that's the next uh, big, big uh, challenge to, to, to address. Uh, so th this approach of grand challenges, which is quite different from funding research in the traditional way. You're all familiar with the NIH way. You put in your ideas. It goes through peer review, et cetera, et cetera. Here is a, a rather different approach. It's more hands-on. It's based on those critical barriers that we need to do. And we will fund the best ideas without bureaucracy. And if someone comes with a great idea presenting a two-page proposal, we'll fund it. Uh, and we'll see if they can take it to the next stage. That kind of approach. Um, and it's brought in very significant resources. The, uh, Bill Gates put in, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation put in $450 million to address um, uh, 14 grant challenges and funded just 44 uh, research projects, just 44, $450 million or more uh, to try and solve those really critical barriers. Uh, it's brought in new talent, so that particular initiative by the, by the Gates Foundation brought in uh, three Nobel Prize winners who are working on other things, refocused them on global health research, and a lot of talent, some of it from the developing world. It has energized communities to uh, rise and meet the challenges, particularly in uh, providing funds for research 
and I'll talk about the Global Alliance for Chronic Diseases uh, in a minute. It's fostered public engagement, so people have become excited. Uh, like after talking to you, those of you who haven't heard about this will probably go and read about it on the internet. Uh, so people get engaged because of the idea of, of this gr uh, grand challenge. As I said, it's an antidote to conservative approaches to funding research. Uh, and to a certain extent, it addresses the defects that we have in global governance of, of, of global health. Uh, there is, um, you would imagine that the World Health Organization would, would be a governing body for this. Well, they do serve a purpose, uh, but they don't have funds to do research. So it's not the global governance mechanism that you would expect. So there are huge gaps in global governance. And this Grand Challenges approach with its focus on priorities is one way to address those, uh, those gaps. So let's start with the uh, Grand Challenges in Global Health. So uh, we worked with the Gates Foundation and the NIH uh, 19, sorry, 2003. Uh, we did the research in Toronto to identify those uh, 14 grand challenges uh, laid out in the form of uh, uh, seven aims. Um, so just let's look at some of the aims to improve childhood vaccines, meaning let's try and make a vaccine that doesn't require refrigeration uh, uh, to, to, uh, to stop it from degrading, develop needle-free delivery vaccines and so on create new vaccines that currently don't exist, uh, control insects that transmit uh, agents of disease. So how can we stop the mosquito uh, from carrying malaria, both through genetic approaches and chemical approaches and so on. So these were 14 huge challenges. And as I said, uh, nearly half a billion dollars went into funding 44 research consortia. And uh, that's become, uh, uh, pretty successful, uh, not only in terms of the research that is produced, uh, some of which is really fascinating, particularly with vector control biology and also producing better food uh, uh, crops uh, for the developing world, uh, particularly for micronutrients. Um, and then there have been a lot of subsidiary outcomes, uh, people emulating the methodology, people uh, uh, using the priorities and so on. Uh, and also including our Grand Challenges Canada, which in a way was very inspired by the Grand Challenges in Global Health program. Secondly, let me talk about uh, chronic non-communicable diseases. So just let me paint the scene here for you. So about, I'm sorry, I don't know what I did there. Oh, I, I, okay. So about 60 million people die every year and people imagine that uh, a lot of people in the developing world die from infectious diseases. Well, it's not so. Uh, of the 60 or so million people who die, um, about half die from cardiovascular disease, 30% die from cardiovascular disease, cancer kills about 15%, chronic respiratory diseases, 7% and diabetes, although it looks like 2%, actually diabetes causes cardiovascular disease, causes stroke and so on. So it's grossly underestimated what diabetes does. And then if you look at uh, communicable diseases, maternal and perinatal conditions and nutritional deficiencies, which are big killers, all that amounts to only 30%. So chronic diseases, which are cardiovascular diseases, mainly heart disease and stroke, Certain cancers, not all of them, not, doesn't include infectious cancers. Uh, chronic respiratory conditions, which kill more than two million people just from indoor pollution alone. Uh, and diabetes, that has been an area that has been totally neglected in the developing world. Understandably, partly because they have to deal with, uh, with uh, tuberculosis, malaria, HIV, other neglected diseases, and what's the budget? The budget in many sub-Saharan African countries for health is $20, $25 per person per year, uh, which is remarkably low. So how, how do you deal with this kind of problems? The risk factors are actually pretty well understood. Uh, not, not exactly how they interact and what you can do about them, but it's tobacco. So uh, smoking will kill one billion people this century if we don't do anything about it, one billion people. 
uh, unhealthy diets, so both overnutrition and undernutrition, physical inactivity, uh, and harmful use of alcohol. So we did a study uh, to identify what are the grand challenges in chronic non-communicable diseases and published in Nature uh, exactly two years ago, no, three years, sorry, three years ago. Um, and we identified 20 grand challenges and suggested 39 research approaches to deal with those uh, 20 grand challenges. And we uh, put those 20 grand challenges in the form of six goals. So it's easier for me to just give you the six goals and then you can imagine the challenges arising. Raise public awareness, enhance economic, legal, and environmental policies, uh, modify risk factors, engage business and community, mitigate health impacts of poverty and urbanization, and reoriented health systems, including medical and health education. Uh, now, it might, it might sound, wow, that's, that's easy. It's easy. I'm, I'm, as, as physicians and scientists, we would focus on goal C, risk factors. We know, you know a little about that, genetics, etc. cetera. Uh, but the others are actually more difficult, much, much more difficult. So um, at the end of that paper, we said chronic non-communicable diseases must urgently receive more resources, research, and attention as mapped out in these grand challenges. Inaction is costing millions of premature deaths throughout the world. So um, you can't just end with that. What do you do having identified this crucial need? So we went ahead and got together uh, NIH, the Canadians, uh, Australians, Chinese, and we created this global alliance for chronic diseases, and you can read about it in a, in a piece in Science at the time we launched it. And uh, so that's Betsy Nabel, a visionary uh, who was at the time the director of uh, NHLBI at NIH, National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. She's now president and CEO of Brigham and Women's in, uh, in uh, Boston, the, the head of the Canadian uh, body, which is equivalent to the NIH, the head of the British body, Chinese, Australian, and we've also got uh, India now coming aboard and South Africa. So what is this uh, Global Alliance about? So it's a funding agency. It's an alliance of funders. Together, these six uh, agencies account for about 80% of all research funding available for uh, biomedicine and health. It's the first of its kind. It focuses on chronic diseases in low- and middle-income countries and low-income populations of high-income countries. It supports collaborative, coordinated research at global scale uh, on low-cost interventions and capacity building. And it ident identifies common approaches to provide the evidence that policymakers need in order to put in uh, uh, programs. So that's what that's about, and, and we can discuss a little more about uh, what are the priorities, what are we going to be funding first, and so on when we come to the discussion. Now let me transition to Grand Challenges Canada, which in some ways is even more exciting because it is a policy development of a government, uh, which is very creative, as you will see. So Grand Challenges Canada is an organization, it's a funding body, uh, it's not for profit organization. Peter Singer is the CEO, I'm the chief scientist. It's a consortium uh, with two uh, government related bodies in Canada the International Development Research Centre, which uh, has a mandate to do research for development for the developing world, and the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, which is the, our NIH equivalent. It's governed by a very tough and strong uh, board of directors. Uh, it's uh, advised by an international scientific advisory board, which I happen to chair, and is hosted by the McLaughlin Rotman Center, as, as we heard. Uh, its mission is to identify grant challenges. So uh, from an idea, you test it, you say, well, this is important. You then go and uh, talk to content experts, and you go through a scientific advisory board, identify a grant challenge. So phone me and, my, and I, after this talk, will be discussing one of these. Uh, in the area of cancer to see whether it's something worth funding 
uh, and then you get the board to say, well, this is great. Uh, put in this much money and develop an RFP. So it's a, it's a really exciting kind of, of, of work. Uh, and uh, we will support implementation and commercialization of the solutions that emerge. So we are building a capacity to actually support commercialization, which is not an easy thing to do. So uh, we've got 20, $225 million for five years to just do five programs. One of them is going to be in chronic non-communicable diseases. One is going to be in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, a point of care diagnostics and another one in maternal neonatal child health, and we are working on others, but just five. Uh, and the government in its budget 2008 talked about supporting the best minds in the world as they search for breakthroughs in global health and other areas. So that other areas they haven't yet funded. There might be funding of equivalent uh, amounts for let's say energy or agriculture. Uh, but those have yet to unfold. Now here's the, here's the clincher and the most important part of all this. This money comes out of the foreign aid budget of Canada. About 5% of the foreign aid budget. And uh, this is the first time that any country in the world has taken the risk of taking money out of foreign aid budget and putting it into this kind of grand challenges approach to solve problems for the benefit of the developing world. Uh, and, and that's controversial. We can discuss that, uh, whether that's the right way to spend foreign aid money or not. Uh, but if other countries did take this up, then this could be a way to get a lot of money into global health and other areas, environment, energy, uh, agriculture, etc., to solve real problems uh, rather than simply hand out money, which sometimes doesn't work. And Grand Challenges uh, Canada has this particular niche. So uh, the Gates Foundation focused primarily on fundamental basic science. Uh, there are people that do social sciences research on health systems and, and uh, cultural issues and so on, how to get technologies and policies to improve health. And then there are business schools that think about business innovation. The sweet spot, we think, is where those three meet. And that's where our focus is, between technological scientific innovation, business innovation, and social innovation. That spot in the middle is where we want to do some creative work. And uh, finally, amongst the grand challenges is this new initiative which has been going on for about uh, a, a, a 10 months now. Um, I'm working with this with the National Institutes of Mental Health at NIH, uh, our center in uh, Toronto, the Wellcome Trust, and all uh, uh, under the aegis of the Global Alliance. So the, the initial impetus for this came from the Global Alliance for Chronic Diseases. And although the definition of chronic diseases that we used and the WHO and the World Bank uses for what constitutes grand, uh, chronic disease does not include mental health. And indeed, the risk factors are, and the approaches are a little different from the others. Uh, this needs a, a treatment of its own. Uh, and we will finish this, res this research before the end of the year and publish it early next year. And my hope is that this will lead to the same kind of energy in terms of funding as did the chronic diseases one and then we will have uh, more focus on, on this totally neglected area, me global mental health. Okay, so those are the four grand challenges that I was going to talk about. Let me now transition to uh, some other work that we have been doing. And I want to introduce that by talking about the hepatitis B vaccine, which was discovered in 1967 here in the United States. The virus was discovered by Baruch Blomberg. Uh, the vaccine was created very rapidly, two years later. Uh, it became available uh, in initially uh, from the blood of patients, later on genetically modified form uh, in the early 80s and was adopted quite widely in the developed world, the rich world. But if you look at what happened to the poor countries, uh, even now, a large part of the developing world does not have hepatitis B vaccine. And I'll show you how cheap it's become, and yet it's not available. So what do you do about this problem? And when we asked ourselves 
that question, the first thing we did is we went out and studied uh, Cuba, Brazil, China, India, South Africa, and what the countries were doing in terms of internalizing modern scientific knowledge and producing uh, health products. Then we went to the level of looking at companies. And then we went to the level of looking at technologies, regenerative medicine, for example. So this piece of work was at the company's level. And an example is a company in India, a pretty remarkable country called Shanta Biotechnics, which is in Hyderabad. And to cut a uh, long story short, one of its products was a hepatitis B vaccine that they made, they improved on the process. And at the time, the vaccine was available for actually more than $15. At that time, if you wanted a shot in New York, it would cost $175. They were able to bring that down to 50 cents. And in fact, now UNICEF purchases this for 39 cents or less a shot. Uh, so now this one company supplies 40%, or until recently did, of uh, the hepatitis B vaccine for UNICEF, which then distributes uh, throughout the world. So we say to ourselves, if India can do that, and there are companies in China doing this, and there are companies in Brazil, those uh, emerging markets, what about Africa, which is the area of uh, the most need and the area of the most opportunity in, the terms, of, in terms of being able to do something about it. And let me just introduce this work by quoting uh, Paul Kagame of Rwanda, who says that we in Africa, uh, and I was born in Africa, I have a sensitivity for that country, I was born in Tanzania. We in Africa must either begin to build up our scientific uh, and uh, technological capacity or remain an, a, an impoverished appendage uh, to the global economy. So what that says is not only do we want to find solutions to our health and development programs, uh, uh, sorry, in, uh, uh, concerns, but we also want to benefit economically from this, if we can. So we began on a program uh, of identifying both stagnant technologies in Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa, and there's a paper coming out in science in, in uh, the next uh, month or two, which documents the stagnant technologies developed by African academics and researchers, but going nowhere. Uh, and I'll give you some examples now. So um, what did we think was a way to stop that constipation of knowledge and get it out to where it's needed? We started working with, uh, that's to tell me I have five more minutes. <laughs> so. Um, we um, started working with uh, Tanzania, uh, with Uganda, where I initially went to medical school before becoming a refugee, and then Ghana, and more recently with Rwanda. And uh, it was all at the invitation of these countries that had somehow found out about our work and said, come and help us think through. We do a lot of research, and you'd be surprised at how much research there's been, even starting from colonial times, there have been research institutes. So they've been around 60, 70 years, and the best that they can do is publish. Very little of that research actually gets translated into policy, improves lives, improves economies, uh, or makes much difference other than to the CV of the researchers. And the governments are saying, how long can we continue to fund research? So come and help us uh, identify ways of unclogging that so that we can get some benefit. So uh, one of the things that uh, we began to think about, because we were based in this uh, incredible center at, uh, in Toronto called the Mars Center. Mars uh, supposedly stands for Medical and Related Sciences. And this is uh, Toronto General Hospital, the facade, which we kept and built a huge complex behind. This is where insulin was first used uh, to, to for diabetes. And, and, and the idea of the Mars Center is to bring business, science, and capital together. So in that building uh, and the complex behind it, we have laboratories, we have venture capital uh, companies, we have legal experts leading in uh, working on intellectual property issues, we have incubators for new companies, and so on. In one building, they meet for lunch, they meet in the cafeteria, they interact, they walk to each other's offices, and, and somehow magic happens. As opposed to the old approach, 
which uh, scientists still focus. I'll do my science. I'll publish in Nature or, sci uh, or in Science or somewhere important, and maybe somebody will pick it up, and maybe somebody will fund it, and I really don't give a, a damn. Uh, I've got my CV, and I've got my promotion, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, but this does a, a different kind of, of thinking, and we thought that it's been um, rather successful in Toronto, and this may be a solution uh, for those countries. So we have uh, um, identified a mechanism uh, which is localized uh, to the circumstances called Life Sciences Convergent um, uh, Centers, initiatives, which are partly physical, smaller scale, virtual, uh, and uh, a lot of other kinds of activities with the idea that this would promote commercialization of African innovation by bringing together science, business, and capital, uh, develop innovative products uh, and services to address local health and and agriculture needs, uh, create one-stop shopping for investors, uh, establish an innovation-based uh, business environment, uh, and move Africa towards a knowledge-based economy. Now, uh, forgive me for saying Africa as if it's one country. Um, it's varied. There are countries that are far ahead of others. Uh, they're really quite varied, but they do also have a certain amount of commonality. Uh, and then redu reduce reliance on aid and promote self-sufficiency. So that's what we are working with those four governments at the moment uh, to do. Uh, now, I've talked about Peter Singer. I've talked about myself. Uh, but this kind of work needs um, a team. And we have quite a large team. Um, if you take the lab component, we are talking of 60, 70 people. Uh, we have uh, people uh, in our team working in South Africa, in India, in Ghana, and so on. So this is quite a large team and these are some of our funding sources. Thank you very much. You know, in our discussions around uh, ethics, we often talk about uh, challenges that patients face locally here. And uh, people question why should we invest and spend our hard, hard dollars uh, globally. Um, with your ethics uh, uh, background, uh, I'd like you to address two issues. One, um, we have a moral imperative to do so. And uh, secondly, um, how did Canada get to the point where they actually decided to commit $220 million to um, an initiative that has uh, global, uh, global um, yeah. you know, such a global scope? I think those are two very important questions. Um, why should we care? Partly uh, because we are one species, and we will either survive and thrive or, or destroy ourselves as a species, not as Americans and Tanzanians and Rwandans. If we have a disease, it's like the bees currently dying from unknown causes. Uh, the whole species will die. So if you think species-wide, there is an imperative, as you said, and it's a moral imperative to try and save each other and make our lives better. There are also those uh, national security issues. There, are also the, there is also the understanding that we have contributed to those problems, either through colonialism, through global warming, through selling tobacco, uh, and that somehow we got to take responsibility for what we have done and so on. So I, I think that um, a child born in, in Chicago is as valuable as a child born in uh, Kigali. And, and if we think like that and actually understand our responsibilities, that answers your question partly. Uh, Canada has always uh, been slightly uh, different um, in the sense that uh, we're neither Europeans nor Americans. Uh, much of our policies are somewhere in between. Um, it's a country that actually respects diversity very seriously. Uh, Toronto is the most multi-ethnic city in the world, uh, something like 135 or 140 ethnicities in one city. Uh, and there are, uh, of course, New York is close, and, and there are other places. Um, and um, it's... Um, uh, already had this IDRC, 
uh, the only one, well, the first one of its kind that actually has been funded for 35 years now, 30 or 35 years by the uh, Canadian government to do research uh, and fund research in the developing world, but research to find solutions to developmental problems. And then we had a minister of, uh, 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 in the finance department that got uh, captured by uh, partly the grant challenges um, uh, of, of the Gates Foundation, partly from reading some of the work that, that, that we had published, and, uh, and said, we'll take a risk on this. And partly it's this conservative government, current conservative government, saying that direct charity doesn't always work. Let's try something else and see if that will work. So it's a combination of things. And they took a risk. And uh, they, have been, um, um, they have been questioned about uh, this approach, but uh, they're continuing with it at the moment. It's pretty new. It was only launched this May. Some of us in the room are um, very jealous of your extraordinary successes and, um, and, and, and look to see the model that you developed to achieve um, both funding from the Canadian government but also this ability to create a global alliance of the six major scientific funders from six uh, great countries, the MRC in England, the NIH here, the Canadians, the Chinese. I mean, that's incredible. It looks to me like and correct me on this one, because it's really a question. The model that you, you work from is that you put together a fabulous group of people. I saw that first paper with um, Varmus as the lead author, yeah. and Zerhuni and yeah. Little, and then your people sort of yeah. near the end. Uh, you publish in very high quality journals. I mean, so much is published in science and nature. Uh, journals with international distributions, uh, you, then, you then use the group uh, and the publication to go for high level uh, financial support for the projects that you've identified as important. And maybe with reliance on, on Gates as sort of a backdrop, um, you, you get enormous credibility in your applications. Um, and, and you're able to, to get 225 million from the Canadian government for five years. Um, I don't know how much this Grand Alliance for Chronic Disease may, may give over the years, but it's, I mean, it's a tremendous achievement. Have you thought through this model, or have I described sort of what you're doing? Uh, it, it is sort of what we're doing. We've been lucky. Uh, I think yeah. identifying that niche, life sciences, global health, and innovation, early on was uh, important. Uh, there, there aren't other groups working even now in a focused way. We were lucky to get uh, substantive grants right early on. Um, the 225 million is not for us. We are uh, going to disperse it right. uh, so people will be applying for grants yes. from, from Grant Challenges Canada. Uh, uh, and our hope, um, Mark, is that other countries uh, and other centers uh, will, will uh, particularly other countries, they, if they could do this uh, Grand Challenges Canada approach and put in three, four, five percent of foreign aid money into uh, finding long-term solutions as opposed to charity and handouts, um, which, which are needed. I mean, if there are people dying of malaria, you need to save them now, right? So that's needed. I'm not saying that that's not needed, but put a tiny percent into doing some research that, that will be long-lasting. Um, it will actually uh, provide uh, a huge amount of resources. So you remember that in 1990, there was a report that uh, identified this 1090 gap, that 10% of research money goes into solving the problems of 90% of people. So only 10% for the rest of the world. 90% is for the rich, 10% of the population. Somebody took a look recently in the last two years to see, is that still so? Is it gone up to 20% now, 2080? The current figure is 1.5% and 98.5%. <laughs> so it's got worse. Yes. We need more resources to address these very complex issues. Uh, and if uh, other countries adopt this, we might begin to uh, solve this problem. There's somebody over there wants to ask a question. Um, thank you for your talk. And for the work you're doing. Your comment on the, um, 
neglect of unintended consequences with the war, Western wars on global terrorism and tyranny um, made me think of a related question. Are there um, potential unintended consequences as we declare no war on global chronic illness and global uh, disparities? Um, are there unintended consequences that we may be guilty of neglecting as well? And is that a, a place where your center is paying attention to? Uh, give me an example of what you you're thinking of. Well, um, what's it, what's in mind? For instance, if, when you're uh, at first glance trying to do away with a tyrannical dictatorship seems like a good. Yeah. Um, oh, I see. Obvious yeah. unintended consequences that have happened to a culture with displacement. Yeah. I'm um, doing away with uh, early death and um, um, smoking or hypertension seem like a good, um, but are there impacts on society that our Western culture are blind to? Yeah. I mean, we see in our current, uh, one of the consequences of living longer is we have a silver tsunami and a change of our whole economic uh, structure and the way that we now institutionalize um, the sick, the dying, the old, the infirm. Um, there's, there's great uh, impact culturally to kind of the, bio, uh, the biomedical model? I think it is something that one has to be alert uh, to all the time. Uh, and also, it's not something that individuals or centers or even countries can, can address uh, uh, ab initio. Uh, will we have more problems down the road if more people survive? Maybe. Uh, but not if you think about more people surviving as ingenious people, creating jobs, uh, building economies, consumers even, uh, then it's a, it's a different perspective. And you see this uh, with uh, countries that have a lot of immigrants, United States, Canada. There's always, uh, there's always people say they're taking our jobs away. But in fact, these economies wouldn't grow without immigrants. So there's always the flip to that. Are they potential black swans? Yeah, but it's in the nature of black swans that we don't know about them now. But you know, your question is really valid. We've got to just be aware and think about these issues. I, I hope you all join me in thanking Dr. Dahl for visiting us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a great pleasure.